chapter 1, we, uh, we began to look, we started last night in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, and began to look at some things here. And uh, I, I, as I mentioned last night, I, I, one of the things I love about, especially the beginning of Hebrews, is how it exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I think Tracy was talking about someone uh, today with me that he said this guy got so disillusioned and disappointed and frustrated with both the politicians and also the masses of people in the country that he said, I just got to the point, I just, I don't have any trust or confidence in mankind at all anymore. I, I trust Jesus Christ and that's all. And well, yeah, that's, that's where we all should be. And yes, yeah, so I think in, in difficult times, which I think we've had some of late, you can dwell on that and analyze it and this and that, but you know, and we all do that. But I think a lot of times it's good just back up and focus on Jesus Christ and give your attention to him. And so that's, uh, that's one of the things, again, I love about this chapter. All right, so Hebrews chapter 1, and let me again begin reading in verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. And so he... Um, as he goes through this first chapter, he's going to, again, exalt Jesus Christ and point out how he's better. And he, later in the book, he does more of that. And so right away here, he talked about the prophets in verse 1, that God spoke by the prophets. And now the comparison in verse 2, hath in his last days spoken unto us by his son. And now he's immediately going to start telling us why the Son is better than the prophets. So in verse 2, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. He never did that with any of the prophets. By whom also he made the worlds. That can't be said of any of the prophets. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory. Again, you can't say that about any of the prophets. So that's the the overall point he's making here, is that Jesus Christ is better. So we uh, concluded last night with the beginning of verse 3, who being the brightness of of his glory. So then verse 3 goes on, and the express image of his person. And that again can't be said of any of the prophets. Turn to John chapter 14, and we'll be coming back to Hebrews 1 all evening. Uh, But John chapter 14, and uh, in verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? So again, Jesus Christ is the express image of his person. He's not like kind of pretty much a good image or something. He's the express image of his person. Uh, Look in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. One of the reasons why it's it's wrong to make any kind of, we know one of the Ten Commandments is not to make graven images and so forth, but I believe Paul teaches the same thing because Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. So it's wrong to make any other sort of image of God. Um, and, and I believe also, uh, I, I believe it's wrong to make any kind of image of Jesus Christ. I, and this is my opinion, so you may disagree, but I don't like any kind of pictures, or not pictures, but drawings, so forth, of Jesus Christ nor I don't like any movies where you have some man and, and they say this is Jesus because that's not Jesus. Uh, and so any or even um, even skits and plays and so forth like that where they have someone playing Jesus. I, I don't like any of that kind of thing. I was at a camp this past summer and uh, someone gave an illustration of being in Adam and in Christ. 
And, uh, you know, the doctrine was good. The, the Word of God does talk about being in Adam or in Christ, so the doctrine was good. But these were fairly small ch young children, and so he was giving an illustration, and so he would put us in Adam, and he had a drawing of Adam, and then he put us in Christ. I don't like that. Any kind of a image of Jesus Christ, I don't, I don't like that at all. Um, so he's, Jesus Christ is the express image of his person. And I don't believe we should make any other kind of image of him. Okay, then back in Hebrews chapter 1, and again in verse 3, and upholding all things by the word of his power. When uh, we, we see that Jesus Christ, at the, at the end of verse 2, he's the creator, by whom also he made the world. And so in verse 3, and upholding all things by the word of his power. So God, God created by speaking. So there, there's power in his words. You can create things with his words. And so Jesus Christ now is upholding all things by the word of his power. Again, uh, look back in Colossians chapter 1. You know, there's... Um, I, I read some very interesting things uh, a couple of years ago. Um, that a lot of this I knew, but a lot of it also I didn't know and really amazed me at how little of what is taught in science is actually proven or known. You know, when I, when I think back as much as I can remember of my science classes in grade school and high school and even college, a lot of that stuff, nobody believes that anymore. I was taught it as though this is absolute proven fact, and a lot of it nobody believes anymore. Um, but even the things that I thought were pretty well proven and settled and everybody agreed upon, this article was going through you know, item after item after item in science and pointing out that these things are not proven. They're, they're theories that in some cases are very widely accepted, but they're not proven, and there are skeptics to all these things. And so one of the things is scientists don't really know what's holding the universe together. They have their theories, but they don't really know. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And then again back in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, upholding all things by the word of his power. And, and again, as we go through all this, keep in mind none of this can be said about any of the prophets. Okay, then again in verse 3, when he had by himself purged our sins. And so there again, you can't say that of any of the prophets. Peter talks about the precious blood of Christ. That, that provides redemption. No one else can do that. Jesus Christ alone could do that. In, uh, in that phrase in verse 3, the uh, notice in King James it says, which he had by himself. In the NIV, they omit by himself. So that opens the door to the possibility that he, Jesus, had a very important instrumental part in this, but you could also have Mary having a part in it, or you know other saints, or um, so it, it opens a door for that because they omit by himself, and then also where the King James says purged, the NIV says provided <clears throat> provided purification. Now. Why do you think they might not like that word purged? Can anybody think of a Roman Catholic doctrine that would come to mind? Purgatory. And so they, they, they changed this word purged to provided, uh, provided purification. So this, the, the NIV and many of the modern translations are very friendly toward the Roman Catholic Church. They, they will make, so in this verse alone, they made two changes that opened the door to accept Roman Catholic teaching. 
and, and there are many, many more examples. But the Word of God says when he, he had by himself purged our sins. So that means there can't be any purgatory because he already did it by, by himself. And then in verse 3 it says, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Turn back to Psalm 110. And uh, in the context of what he's talking about there in Hebrews, when he by himself purged our sins, he sat down. And the reason being because the work is finished. The purging work is finished. So again, there can't be any such thing as purgatory. Uh, Psalm 110 and verse 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. So uh, it was prophesied that the Lord was going to sit down. And you can see in this verse, and we could look at others, the sitting at the right hand, it has to do with being put in a position of honor and a position of authority. And so that's the position that Jesus Christ took. Um, remember earlier in Hebrews, we saw that he's heir of all things. Uh, turn to, before I go back to her, uh, Hebrews, turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and beginning in verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet, and if you look back at verse 29, you can see it's talking about David. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus, and that, that's, that, those first two words in verse 32 are very important because he's talking to the men of Israel. They just crucified the Lord and he's making it very clear it's this Jesus, the one that you crucified. So in verse 32, this Jesus hath God raised up whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which, we, uh, which ye now see and hear. So being by the right hand of God exalted. Right, then back to Hebrews chapter 1. So when uh, in these first three verses in chapter 1 of the book of Hebrews, we already have seen that Jesus Christ is the prophet, the priest, and the king. So he's a prophet because he's, God spoke by him in verse 2. He's the priest because he purged our sins. And he's the king because he's heir of all things. And, uh, and he's been exalted to the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, then verse 4. Being made so much better. And that's, that's I've been saying the point is that he's better. So he's better than the prophets. We've seen that. Now in verse 4, being made so much better than the angels, uh, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So now he's going to, the author of Hebrews is going to devote a considerable amount of time to making the point that he's, Jesus Christ is so much better than the angels. And that might seem a, a bit strange that so much attention would be devoted to that. But one thing, keep in mind in Colossians, Paul talks about those who are worshiping angels. So that's clearly an issue, e even in the dispensation of grace in Paul's ministry. But then also, um, uh, and, and of course, in, in the nation of Israel, there are many times when angels appeared and spoke to people and so forth. So that also made angels of, of considerable interest and importance. Um, but also look in, uh, turn to Galatians chapter 3. And there's another reason here in Hebrews why he devotes so much attention to angels and that Christ is better than, so much better than the angels. So Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. 
and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So as you read on in the book of Hebrews, a major theme, you could even argue it's the major theme in the book of Hebrews, is that the new covenant is better than the old covenant. And the old covenant is passing away. You need to move on to the new covenant or the New Testament. So we see in this verse that the angels were associated with the giving of the old covenant. And so that's another reason why in Hebrews why he wants to make the point so the angels are associated with the Old Covenant, Jesus Christ with the New Covenant or the New Testament. So that's another reason he wants to make the point, he's better than they. And that's another argument for why this covenant is better than that covenant. Okay, then go back again to Hebrews chapter 1. Um, so when it says in verse 4, being made so much better than the angels, that's not talking about the eternal nature of Christ, that, that Christ in his person is better than the angels. Um, and of course that would be true, but that's not what this is saying because it says, it says being made. Jesus Christ was not made or created in, in that sense. So that, that's not what it's talking about. Um, by the way, in verse 4, the NIV says, um, at the beginning of verse 4, it says, so he became. But yeah, he didn't become anything in verse 4. It says being made. That's something that someone else did, God the Father did. It's not what he, what Jesus Christ became. Um, let me, before we go on in the text here, let me just rattle off several things about angels. Most or all of this you already know, and I won't take time to look at a lot of verses, but I'll just, as I said, just rattle off several things. Um, so first of all, angels are created beings. And he, he makes that point clearly here in Hebrews chapter one. And again, that's very important because that's another reason why Jesus Christ is so much better because he's a creator and they're created beings. Um, turn to Genesis 19. Um, Genesis 19, I'm sadly going to have to get a new Bible at some point because my pages are so thin and worn that I can sometimes hardly turn them. Uh, Genesis chapter 19 and verse 1. And there came two angels, so notice two angels, to, <coughs> to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Right? Then go down to verse 5. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the two men which came into thee? And as you read through Genesis 19, it goes back between angels, men, angels, men, so this is one of the places, and we could look at every other place where angels appear, where there's any kind of a description of them and so forth, that angels in the, in the scriptures are always men, always have the appearance of men. So if you look at a lot of the paintings and so forth, um, angels are very effeminate, and that is not what an angel is in the word of God, anything but that. Uh, and of course, also, Many times angels have wings, and that's not in the scriptures. So, you know, there, there are many things like that that are commonly believed. A lot, many people believe that, I, I've often, I often hear people say, they tell me so-and-so died, and they said, well, she's an angel now, or he's an angel now. No, no, he's not. She's not. Um, also, turn to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. There are a number of passages uh, in the Word of God where you see angels clearly, in, in many cases, have a very fearsome appearance. As I said, anything but effeminate. Uh, Matthew 28 and beginning in verse 3. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. So here again is a case where an there's an angel appears, 
But this is obviously not, he doesn't look like just your normal guy. He, his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow and for fear of him. So angels, again, uh, not all the time, but oftentimes can have a very fearsome appearance. Um, turn to Matthew chapter 4, and uh, we will see this stated um, later in, in Hebrews 1. But in Matthew chapter 4, um, and, and we, we will see that in Hebrews chapter 1, it says that angels are ministers. So notice Matthew chapter 4 and verse 11. In the, in the context, of course, this is where Jesus was tempted of the devil. Matthew chapter 4, verse 11. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. And so, and this again, in the context of Hebrews 1, is another reason why he's better than they are because they, they came and ministered to him. Um, also, in turn, uh, Matthew 26, once again. Matthew 26 and verse 53. says, uh, thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? So there also are, are a number of scriptures in addition to this to tell us that the number of angels is great. There are many, many angels. Uh, then um, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 and verse 10. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And so also angels have personality. They're not just robots or something. They, they have personality. Um, also, angels can speak to men. Um, there are a number of cases in the scriptures where that happens. Paul even said in Galatians 1, angels could preach a gospel. So uh, ma um, turn to Matthew 22. Matthew 22 and beginning in verse 28. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So angels don't marry and they don't procreate with one another. Now, many of you understand that it's significant that I added the with one another. They don't procreate with one another. Okay, then... Um, in turn to Job 38. And again, keep in mind uh, the point that we are in Hebrews 1 now. He's going to make the point that, that Jesus Christ is better than the angels. And uh, Job uh, 38 and verse 7 says, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So the, the sons of God here, the angels, talking about at creation. They observed the creation and shouted for joy. So angels are called sons of God, but they are never, God never calls them my son. And he never calls them the son. And so that's, we'll see in Hebrews, that that's significant. That's another thing that makes the sun better than the angels. And then uh, just one more point uh, regarding angels, and that is that angels are not subject to death. And this point is made later in the book of Hebrews. All right, let's go back then to the book of Hebrews. So that tells us a little bit about angels. And so again, in Hebrews chapter one and verse four, being made so much better than the angels as he hath obtained uh, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Um, I 
the I, I believe what he's talking about here, the excellent name is son. He's the son. And none of the prophets are the son, and none of the angels are the son or my son. And so, uh, again, I believe that's the more excellent name. All right, then verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son? This day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And, of course, the answer to that question, to which of the angels said he at any time, he never said this to any of the angels. He said this to the son, and that's, that's why the son is better than the angels. This, uh, this is a quotation. Turn back to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. So again, he says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And so he's quoting from Psalm 2. And let's begin in verse 5. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king, and so this is God the Father speaking, yet have I set my king, Jesus Christ, upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, and so now this is now the Son saying, this is what the Father said unto me, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall, give, uh, I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So again, this is the quote where the quotation is from. Now, one of the questions that arises um, in the mind of theologians, at least, if, if not others, is, is Jesus Christ the eternal Son or did he at some point become the son? Okay, um, I already turned away from Psalm 2, but if you're there, stay there for a moment. If you're not, you might want to get back there. So is he the eternal son? And some would argue that. Or did he at some point become the son? So the first thing I want to say is that in the Old Testament, he is only spoken of as the being the son in, in prophetic passages. He's never, if I can say it, in real time in the Old Testament called the son. So an example of what I'm talking about is um, in, in Psalm 2. He says, serve, serve the Lord, uh, verse 11, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So in verse 12, he's called the son, but this is prophetic of the second coming. So in the prophetic context of the second coming, according to this verse, he's the son. But again, in real time in the Old Testament, he's never called the son. Again, only in prophetic passages such as this. Uh, turn to Luke Chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and beginning in verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So this really... Um, historically is the first time that he's called the son is when th this announcement is made that we just read uh, here in Luke chapter 1. Um, turn to Philippians chapter 2. So um, in my understanding, 
he became the son at birth. That's historically, again, the first time I believe that he's called the son. Uh, and again, it was by birth. Okay, then Philippians chapter 2 and beginning in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. So take note of that. He took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So again, who, um, he took upon him the form of a servant. Okay, then um, turn to, um, go back to Luke chapter 1. Uh, chapter 3, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 3. So again, I, 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 don't, I don't believe that the term son is a title that's given to him in real time through the Old Testament. But it's given to him first when he's born, as we just read in Luke 1. Okay, Luke chapter 3 and verse 21. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not, uh, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, um, that didn't, did, <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm sure you would highlight that in the recording too. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> yeah, well, all right, chapter three is what I told you, I believe, and where I should have been. So Luke chapter three and verse 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying the, uh, the heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. And so here it is baptism. He is specifically addressed as the son. So not in a prophetic sense, but in a, again, real time sense. And then also look in Mark chapter 9. And, and again, I believe he became the son by birth. And so um, after that, it is baptism. He's addressed as the son. And then in Mark chapter 9, and beginning in, so if you look at uh, verse 2, it says, and after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves and he was transfigured before them. So that's the context. And go down to verse seven. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly when they had looked round about, they saw no man anymore, save Jesus only with themselves. And so here again, he's specifically addressed as the son. Um, now look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was made. So this is talking about, as you see, in the beginning is the time context of this. And it talks about him being, at that time, he was God and he created all things. But notice here he's the word. He's not the son. Then go down to, in chapter 1, go down to verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then uh, go to the most well-known verse in the Word of God, John chapter 3, 
and verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son because the word became flesh and again with his birth he becomes the son. So God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Um, turn to the book of Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, and beginning in verse 29. And, and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead, and he was seen, uh, and he was seen many days of, of them, which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, and that's what we just read a few minutes ago, thou art my son, this, <coughs> excuse me, this day have I begotten thee. So when you read Psalm 2, which we again just did, I think a couple of questions arise. He says, this day, what day? Um, and then this day have I begotten thee. And so what, what does that mean? Well, clearly here, um, if you look at verse 33, he, he clearly, Luke here clearly tells us that that verse is prophetic of the resurrection of Christ. So, this day is the day of resurrection. And so in that context, he says, thou art my son. And he says, this day have I begotten thee. So there, we'll look at some other verses in a moment, but um, there are a couple of terms used in the Bible that we have to be careful not to confuse. So in this case, it, it talks about him being begotten. And there are verses where it talks about Christ being the only begotten. And then there are other verses, and we'll look at some in a moment, where it talks about him being the firstborn. So, so the, the thing is, he's the only begotten because that's speaking of, uh, of him in his virgin birth. He's the only one ever conceived of the Holy Ghost and born of a virgin. So he's the only begotten in that sense. Now here it doesn't say in verse 33, it doesn't say only begotten. It just says, this day have I begotten thee. And in other places, as I, as I said, he's called the firstborn. And when it talks, so only is again the virgin birth. First, firstborn or first begotten, that's talking about in his resurrection. Because he's not the, he's again the only one ever to be conceived of the Holy Ghost and born of a virgin but he's not the only one ever who will be raised with an eternal glorified body. He's the first, but not the only. And so we clearly, um, in verse 33 here, we clearly see the, the meaning of uh, what's written in Psalm 2. All right, then uh, turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse 3. Concerning his son... Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And of course, that's his, his birth. And then verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So it doesn't say that he became the Son at this point. He was already the Son, but he was declared to be the Son of God with power in the resurrection. Um, turn to Romans 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 20, uh, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So here's that word, firstborn. So this is not talking about his virgin birth because there are no more, only him. But in this case, it's first. 
So this is talking about him being raised with an eternal glorified body. He's the first one, but not the only one. He's the firstborn among many brethren. Um, there are a number who are teaching um, these, these days. It was taught, been taught for a long, long time. But there are some who are really making a big issue of this, that in verse 29, that uh, being conformed to the image of his son is the idea that we are supposed to day by day be, we should be coming more and more godly. And we, each day as the days go by, we should more and more and more be, be being conformed to the image of his son. That's not what this verse is talking about. It's talking, and that I think is very clear when he says that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He's again talking about the resurrection in glory. Um, turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Oh, here, here he adds from the dead, so that makes it even more simple to understand what he's talking about. So this, again, it's not talking about his birth in Bethlehem, but it's talking about his resurrection and glory. He's the firstborn from the dead. And then Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood. So um, elsewhere it says he's the only begotten. That's talking about, again, his virgin birth. Here he's the first begotten, and then again it adds of the dead. So again, this is talking about his resurrection and glory. Turn back to Psalm 89. Psalm 89. And uh, again, the uh, in Hebrews, you don't have to turn to Hebrews now, turn to Psalm 89. But in Hebrews chapter 1, and verse 4, it says, Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. That, that word son um, has a significance that some may not really realize or think of. Psalm 89 and verse 27 says, Also, I will make him my firstborn. So here's that term already back in the Old Testament here. Um, and then it goes on, higher than the kings of the earth. And so, as I mentioned, I believe briefly last night, the, the primary significance of firstborn in the word of God is not that you're the first one to be born. The primary significance of it is that it's a position of honor and authority. And so you see here again in verse 27, also I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. Okay, then uh, go back to Hebrews 1. So I, I believe the, the title son, when we talk about Jesus Christ being the son, it's associated with his birth, and it's associated with his resurrection, and it's associated with him being the king. Um, okay, then uh, again in Hebrews chapter 1, and ver by the way, um, I've been pointing out a number of things, problems with the NIV. In, uh, in chapter 1 and verse 5, the NIV says, You are my son, today I have become your father. So that's, you know, when people say, you know, there aren't, you know, there may be differences in the wording and the different translations, but it doesn't affect any doctrine. <laughs> it affects a lot of doctrine. And the NIV makes an absolute mess of who Jesus Christ is. So 
Um, all right, then in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 5 again, uh, he says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Okay, this comes from Second Samuel. So Second Samuel chapter 7. So the first part we saw is in Psalm 2. And the last part is from Second Samuel chapter 7. And uh, we won't take a long time here with the context. I think you all know it anyway. But uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 14. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of, of men. And so this again is where that quotation in Hebrews comes from. I will be his father and he shall be my son. And again, it's in the context of Jesus Christ reigning as king. Um, go back, uh, turn to Psalm 72 first, Psalm 72. So what I believe is that Jesus Christ became the son when he was born, as we read, for example, in Luke 1. And now, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that he became God or that he obtained deity at that point. He's always been God. He's a creator. We saw that in Hebrews 1, and we've talked about that. So, he, so that it's not that he, at, at a certain point, became God. But I believe he became the son at his birth, and then um, uh, Psalm 72. And then I believe that he becomes the, so by birth he becomes the son, but then I believe he becomes the son by adoption in when he takes the throne in the kingdom. We'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But Psalm 72 and verse 1 says, give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. So notice here it talks about the king's son. And then go down to verse 11. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. So who is it that all nations are going to serve? The king's son. All right, then um, go to Galatians chapter 4. And, and by the way, that's David's son. He's the son of David. So, that's, so that makes him the, ki the king's son. Okay, then uh, Galatians chapter 4. And we, we often read this passage talking about us, which is appropriate. But as I read these verses now, I want you to think about Jesus Christ more, more so. All right, so Galatians chapter 4 and verse 1. Now I say that the heir as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Now remember, we read in Hebrews that he's the heir of all things. But then we also read in Philippians that he took upon him the form of a servant. Okay, then, and so in verse 1, he's, he's the heir and he's a servant at the same time. Verse 2, But as under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, and now notice, made of a woman, made under the law. And then verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, and so notice, sons, there are son in connection with Christ, and because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And so, putting together what we talked about a little bit last night, more so tonight, um, I believe again that Jesus Christ became the son when he was born in Bethlehem. But then he took upon the form of a servant. And so when he was on earth, he was a servant. And then I believe by adoption, he becomes the son at the second coming. 
and, and takes, his, takes the throne no longer as a servant, but he's now the son and, and heir of the, the heir of all things. All right, um, let's, um, yeah, let's stop there. So thank you very much. Father, we thank you again for uh, the time today to, to spend more time looking in Hebrews chapter 1. And I pray again that we would have a better understanding of who Jesus Christ is and why he's better than the prophets and better than the angels. We thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Only if, only if they're simple. And if it's not.